thanks for, yeah. very much for uh, inviting me along this evening. Uh, I'm squadron leader Mark Discoom. Uh, I'm known as just Disco uh, within the Royal Air Force, and that's purely because of uh, my uh, my surname. There's no great story to it. So I've got a bit of a, a presentation, so you're not going to have to look at me throughout this one hour, well, roughly one hour period. Um, and the plan will be to remind me what to say and move on. I'm going to tailor this. I bet I've had a, a bit of an IT faff, so... Um, uh, this isn't the perfect presentation I want to give to a bunch of aviators, um, but it will allow me to steer myself in the right direction. The first few slides are, in essence, uh, a little bit of where I'm from, what I, what I, where I come from and what I do and what I've done in the Royal Air Force. Uh, I'll rattle through those quite quickly and try and get onto the actual operating side. And certainly when I talk about BBMF, the important bit for me is to let you know how we operate um, and, and you know, try to garner some of the safety bits, some of the, the synergies we have in and the way we operate our aircraft in Class G airspace, generally at busy weekend times as well as during the week. So that's my simple introduction. Uh, next slide, please. So where have I come from? Well, this is a, uh, quite an apt thing for me. So um, I'm uh, from South Wales, uh, joined the Air Force at 18. But prior, I've always had a love of flying. So started with the Sindaf and Air Show when I was three with my dad, went you know, pretty much to every single one. Um, the first taste of real flying I got, although I joined the Air Cadets at 13, was gliding. So I was a member of um, uh, the South Wales Gliding Club based um, in uh, near Usk uh, in South Wales. Um, and I started flying at the age of 14. Um, that is not a glider that I was fortunate enough to fly. Um, I ended up flying K-13s and then eventually onto the K-8. Um, and, you know, it was fantastic at the age of 16 to be sitting there uh, flying, you know, a single seat aircraft. It would be quite some time after that before I managed to get into another single seat aircraft. So I think gliding, certainly the purity of the flying, has stood me in good stead to, you know, the training of the Royal Air Force, because it is, as we call it, pure flying. Uh, it's you using your wits, airmanship, you know, flying the aircraft with a feel of it. There's no, you know, carefree handling. You have to feel the aircraft flying. So I think personally, it's a fantastic place, um, uh, a fantastic type of flying. And for me, a great start for my RAF career. Um, I was in the uh, Air Cadets, as you can see there, probably about 16 years old there. Um, and I was lucky enough to get a, a Royal Air Force flying scholarship. So Cardiff Wales Airport with a PAE 38, uh, if I do the maths right, I think it's the 38, Tomahawk, uh, which was the first aircraft, powered aircraft I flew up there. So that's kind of my background. I joined straight from A-levels uh, at the age of 18. So next slide. Um, making the grade against all odds. Uh, this is my inspirational bit for kids, really. Um, if you sit, if I sat back and looked at the odds of me making it through Royal Air Force flying training um, from the very beginning to become an officer all the way through to the end, I probably would have walked up, you know, walked off and, and got a cup of coffee because, you know, huge odds against me. Um, but that wasn't the case. Um, the photo on the left is um, uh, uh, my instructor. That was us landing a Jet Provost T Mark 5A into. St. Atham, because we were both from the same air training corps, 1092 in Bridge End. Um, and uh, the one on the right is me graduating from that course uh, at the age of, at that point, I was just turning 19 at that point, because uh, the Air Force, there was no holes and you went straight through. Uh, next slide, please. So still at the age of 19, I was uh, awarded my wings from RAF Valley after flying the Hawk T1. Um, at the time, the course was two different courses valley were doing the advanced uh, flying training and then you went on to either chivener or broadly to do weapons training that's different now um so you know incredible pride moment for me i always used to say that was kind of my university graduation for me uh, after coming through you know straight from school uh next slide please told you i'd rattle through these ones nice and quickly I became a creamy curfew at that point. This is my course photo with some very senior people, some people there who had uh, taken part in Gulf War One and done some incredible things. And there's me as a, a 20 year old now um, uh, becoming a first tourist qualified flying instructor. They deemed when I got my wings at the age of 19 that actually I was material to be an instructor. So I was what they call creamed off. I call myself milked off. I was not the top of the course, um, but they saw that I had maybe uh, the right attitude to be an instructor which is very different to, or not quite the same as being a very good uh, pilot uh, there's you know there's different uh, characteristics uh, so next slide please I ended up then going up to RAF Lintornews 
Uh, I'd just been promoted a flying officer, pretty junior rank, uh, at the age of 20 as a fully qualified RAF instructor, uh, initially on the Jet Provost and then onto the Takano. So halfway through that tour, I got uh, um, uh, converted to the Takano. And I was very lucky as a, a 23 year old in 1994, I was the uh, Takano display pilot. So um, for me, you know, that was an incredible honor, incredibly young to do that as well, to be an RAF display pilot. Uh, and I did that in 1994 before moving on again. So the slide can go on now, ta. Um, and I went back to the Hawk. So there's a Hawk T1 in the background, uh, and this time to do tactical weapons training. Um, so the Hawk T1 at the time would have a 30 millimeter cannon pod under it, uh, and we would have two carrier bomb light stores, CBLS. And those were used to carry very small three kilogram practice bombs, really nothing more than a flash charge that made a flash and a bit of smoke. So you could mark where the bomb had landed and learning about tactics, low level flying. At the end of that, you get your dream sheet. Where do you want to go? Um, obviously, you can write what you want. The RAF decides where you go. I was very fortunate for the next slide to get my first choice, and that was to fly the Jaguar. So I ended up um, in 1996 converting to the Jaguar. Uh, and I did near enough 10 years on the Jaguar, staying through to it um, right to the end of it in uh, 2007 with one ground tour in between, uh, amassing 2,200 hours and pretty much seeing the world uh, from the single seat cockpit. I did operations over Bosnia when I first joined um, and I also did, <coughs> excuse me, northern Iraq. Uh, which was the first time I was shot at, and I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. Um, uh, although I was doing reconnaissance, so all I could do is take a nice photo back. Um, next slide. Uh, from that point, uh, I did lots of ground tours. Uh, I'm not going to go on about that. In the Royal Air Force, flying the mahogany bomber, as we call it, is, is not an incredible, uh, exciting thing to tell you all about. So I'll skip those. But in, in, interspersed with this, when I got promoted to squadron leader, I took on a few ground roles and eventually my poster, my you know, HR expert looking after my career said, what do you want to do next? And I said, I'll fly anything with wings. I didn't want them to make me a parachute instructor or anything silly. Um, so I said, give me anything with wings. And they said, how about deputy officer commanding elementary flying training? And I said, that sounds awesome. So I got to brush off my instructional skills and uh, to fly the tutor. So the um, uh, the suit between uh, on in the audience will notice that not all those aircraft are the same. We're over College Hall officers mess at RAF Cranwell. The two rear aircraft are Grob 115 tutors, and the nearest one is the Grob 120 TP Prefect. <clears throat> um, we're still using the tutors in the background, but that's now to fly Air Cadets and University Air Squadron. The nearest aircraft now as part of the um, uh, private uh, finance initiative <clears throat> and contract inside the military flying training uh, system is the Prefect, uh, which is a turbine powered elementary flying training aircraft capable of 120, uh, 180 knots crew. So a very capable glass cockpit trainer. And I spent about five years doing that because halfway through my tour, I decided to um, throw my uh, name in uh, to become the next officer commanding uh, Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. So if we go to the next page, and I'll start to slow down now because we get some more of the exciting stuff. Quick recap, those are the aircraft excluding the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight that I flew, and everyone with a red square around uh, are ones that I instructed on as a qualified flying instructor. Okay, so on to the pretty cool stuff. So I was selected to become officer command in the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight in 2014, but I only took command uh, two years ago. Uh, as you can imagine, um, there is nowhere else in the Royal Air Force where you can get experience flying these uh, wonderful aircraft. So to build up the experience, to become the RAF's expert on them, you need to do four years as a part-time member. So I carried on uh, doing the training at Cranwell, elementary flying training, whilst I slowly built up through the system uh, on BBMF. So it was really odd. I turned up and everyone said, well done, you're going to take over the flight. It was like, not really. There's a boss there now. Then there's his deputy who's going to take over from him. And then there's me. So there's a really good long process. So by the time after four years, um, I kind of know the ropes. I've done all the displays. 
um, I've converted to all the aircraft types because I become the expert for the Royal Air Force. I flight test all these aircraft and a Mark 19 I air tested a year ago is the first time I flew in four years. So you really need to you know, have an understanding about these, how these aircraft are supposed to fly before you can sign them up as serviceable. So um, we're very lucky on the flight. Um, the aircraft we've got, and I'll go through the process of the training. I'll try to remember to talk a, bit, a little bit about how we operate uh, and how we operate safely around gliders as well. But to give you a flavor in the hangar, I have without doubt, and nobody has ever um, said uh, differently, including the chief of the air staff, the best hangar in the Royal Air Force. So under the roof, not quite at the moment because some of them are off uh, with contractors for maintenance. I would normally have under my command um, two chipmunks for training. So they're post-war training aircraft, you'll see in a moment. I have two hurricanes, two of only about 14 in the world. I have six Spitfires. Uh, there's about 55, 60 of those flying in the world. And we've got some incredibly special ones. So the nearest one in this picture is the only Spitfire still flying that actually took part in the Battle of Britain. So that's our Mark IIA, just probably, I think, the most precious aircraft uh, flying, certainly Spitfire flying in the world. Um, we have a Dakota, um, which whilst we use it in, for some elements of training, has got an incredible pedigree um, and an incredible history. And then the jewel in the crown, we have uh, one of only two flying Lancasters. So 12 aircraft, yet I'm a flight. So even though I've got squadron strength uh, and that's good because we're slightly out of kilter with ranks. If it was a squadron, I'd need to be a wing commander. So I'm quite glad they've kept it as a flight and I can be a squadron leader and enjoy myself. Next slide, please. So where are we? So REF Coningsby in Lincolnshire. It is one of three fast jet bases in the UK now. You've got Lossiemouth in Scotland and Marham in Norfolk. Um, an incredibly busy place. Uh, it has uh, four and a half typhoon squadrons. That seems an odd thing to say, I know. Uh, there's the Operation Conversion Unit. Uh, there are three frontline squadrons, uh, which are uh, uh, 11, 12 and three. I'm looking at the map and figuring out where they all are. And the half squadron, which is odd, is we've got 41 squadron. They're the, it's a very small um, specialized unit, which is used for operational test and evaluation. Um, at the base, very much like in the Battle of Britain, we've got armed aircraft sitting there on quick reaction alert, ready to go at you know, minutes notice. And just in the corner of it, I have my hangar, uh, a relatively small hangar crammed full of these beautiful aircraft. It is currently one of only five um, stations uh, in Lincolnshire that fly from with the Royal Air Force. That's a huge amount. RF Lincolnshire, as we call it, that's the biggest cluster of flying stations. Um, however, uh, if we rolled ourselves back into the back end of the war, there would have been 49 flying bases. In fact, just bomber bases, more fighter bases in Lincolnshire alone during the Second World War. So a very busy place. And it's why Lincolnshire is known as Bomber County. Next slide. What do we do then? Um, so it's great that I've got this uh, in, uh, you know, amazing array of aircraft, but obviously the RAF doesn't just say go off and have some fun. And it's the one thing that I suppose when you join the military or any type of professional flying, you don't get to say what you want to do. Uh, and that's why I still love doing um, civilian flying and, and flying Cessnas and things like that, because then you are you're the master of your own destiny. Uh, I always have a task. So uh, these are the four main tasks. Um, commemorate uh, my VVIPs on the flight and the thing that I will remember more than anything else including flying these aircraft is meeting the veterans the second world war veterans whilst we commemorate all veterans from the very founding 1st of April 1918 uh, of the Royal Air Force and the Royal Flying Corps and Royal Naval Air, uh, Air Service before that all the way through to the veterans we make today every day people are leaving the military uh, and becoming veterans um, because of the nature of the aircraft we fly, we have a focus on, uh, you know, what I consider to be the greatest generation and sitting down and talking to them, listening to them talk so sort of unfazed about the things they did. It is literally to them just their job uh, and telling you stories that literally films have been made about is literally awe inspiring. And it is what I will take away from this tour more than anything else. So to be able to go over events where I know there are veterans of any type is a real honour. 
ceremonial. That is my one and only uh, formal defence task to do ceremonial fly past. So later on, I'll tell you about, you know, yes, you can ask for a fly past uh, and I'll, I'll explain how to do that. Um, we only do public events. We don't do weddings or birthdays. Now, there's one birthday we do, and that's because she's my boss. OK, so the Queen does get a birthday fly past. Nobody else will get one. OK, and that's because she owns everything. I love to celebrate. So as well as looking at um, commemorating the past, we look to celebrate the current Royal Air Force. Apart, uh, apart from me and one other pilot on BBMF, everybody else is part time. Um, everybody else. I've got people now um, already around the world supporting operations and humanitarian relief, flying large aircraft, transport aircraft, bringing in PPE for the NHS. And they just come into BBMF on their own time almost as a second job. Um, so we can celebrate what we're doing right now. And then the other thing I love doing, and I've done so many of these virtually over, over this uh, summer and, the, and during lockdowns, is to inspire future generations. Regardless of if they join the Royal Air Force, I don't care. Um, um, it's really to just make sure they understand that wherever you come from, whatever you do, there's, you can achieve so much more. So I love doing that sort of thing and talking to our future generations who, if I, if sometimes people go, oh, you know, would the, the current generation do what the past generation did? Uh, talking to Jeffrey Wellham, uh, the late Jeffrey Wellham, one of the youngest, if not the, we think the youngest Battle of Britain pilot, um, he, he had no doubt of the current generation, if put in their position, would do the right thing and be stood up and be counted for. And that was heartwarming to listen uh, to, as he was at the time, a 95 year old saying that. Next slide, please. Right, what do we do with all of that then? So the scale of activity is huge, more than any other display um, um, uh, team in the Royal Air Force, including the Royal Air Force aerobatic team, the Red Arrows. We get about 1,500 or so bids. That's, that's looking down this year because I think people are fed up of organising stuff and actually it not happening. And we expect about 1,000 events a year. 90 displays were planned this year and 950 fly past. You'd be glad to know we managed to achieve 40 events which is rubbish, but funny old thing with COVID, there was not a lot we could do. Um, normally, when we go to those fly past and displays, we expect actually probably in excess of 8 million as an audience. We did all right this year. So those people that saw Flying for Britain with Sir David Jason, that got us a big audience as a documentary. Um, and we did some fairly big ticket events. So some national uh, uh, events, things like Captain Tom's Fly Past, um, and VEVJ Day 75th anniversaries, which were showing on uh, on national TV. So I hope the audience was out there remembering um, the sacrifices. Uh, uh, and that's what it's all about for us. It's nothing to do about me, what I'm from and that, although I've talked very quickly about that. It's about the aircraft and what they represent. Next one. Right, pilot training. I'm still an instructor uh, and I've got to turn somebody from a Typhoon pilot on the left, which is like what I'm currently doing with two new BBMF pilots and get them into an aircraft on the right, which is a hurricane. So the uh, uh, my um, deputy, he's going to take over for me next October. Um, he currently is an instructor on the Typhoon OCU. And what he would suggest is that the Typhoon is very easy to fly, but very hard to operate. And he says that because you're not flying it. That thing between your legs is not connected to anything but a computer. You can waggle it around. And if if the man in the back seat has taken control yeah, and I've flown the Typhoon just as a passenger, you can play with a stick and it's not connected to anything. It's quite uh, an odd experience to be moving a stick and nothing happening with the aircraft. Um, however, to operate it with all the sensors and the speed it's flying at takes a lot of practice. On the right, the Hurricane. Well, incredibly easy to operate. There's, there's literally nothing much inside you've got to worry about. You look outside and fly it like a glider. But because it's old and because uh, the you know, huge, en huge engine up front, um, it, it produces some interesting um, uh, handling characteristics. And that's what we focus on. How do we do that? On the next slide, you'll see our training aircraft. We use the de Havilland Chipmunk brilliant aircraft um, used as a an elementary flying training uh, aircraft for the Royal Air Force up to the mid 90s. It was that good. And I can understand why. And we are the last military operator in the UK of these. Um, we have two of them. The difference is then for a tail dragger, those that haven't flown it before. Uh, first of all, something really simple. You can't see where you're going. 
And you can see actually in this picture, the, the pilot's straining to try and see over the nose. So we weave the aircraft, We're not rubbish at taxiing. You need to weave down the taxiway to see either side of the nose. And um, the other thing is the center of gravity is behind the main wheels. And, and if you have anything that you try to push along with a, a half center of gravity, the center of gravity wants to overtake and get ahead. OK, that's the same as if you throw a dart backwards. OK, they'll flip round quickly. If that happens in a, in a, in a tailwheel aircraft, it's called a ground loop. And it's, it's pretty bad. Well, it can be bad for the aircraft and sometimes the pilot. Um, and there was a civilian hurricane ground loop at Duxa this year and ended up with an undercarriage uh, collapse and a lot of damage. Um, so we get them to use their feet. Now, talking to glider pilots, you go, yeah, obviously, that's how you fly aircraft. You use your feet to keep the either the string or the ball in, you know, in the right direction and that nice and uh, upright. Well, fast jet pilots with a jet engine, you don't need to. And it's certainly the Typhoon. It's been flown by the computer. So I have to reteach them what their feet are for. Um, I'll generally say mechanical empathy with our old aircraft, slow hands but you need to be resolute with a rudder, so fast feet. Slow hands, fast feet is how we're gonna fly these aircraft. Um, and there's a few other bits that uh, as we go along with the aircraft, you know, the sort of challenge them. Initially, I get them in the front seat and eventually I put them in the back so they can see even less out the front. Uh, because with our aircraft, with the big Merlin engines and the Griffin in the later Spitfires, you physically can't see where you're landing. Next one. Uh, first aircraft, um, we do actually do a very quick confidence check in a, in a borrowed Harvard, but then really we stick somebody in a hurricane. Um, we've got no simulator, we've got no two-seater, so I'll get them to read the book. I'll, I'll give them a verbal test. Um, I'll you know, give them a bit of training. Um, and then I go, right, off you go. In fact, the words I use for the first trip is the same thing that um, Jeffrey Welland, the Battle of Britain pilot, was told, which is there's a hurricane out there. Go and take it flying, and if you break it, there'll be hell to pay. Uh, he actually had his first trip on the on uh, 92 scone with a Spitfire, but the same words were used by his boss in the Battle of Britain, which is prior to it for him. The Hurricane is quite old fashioned. So from the cockpit backwards, it is World War One design. It is uh, wooden fabric. You've got the Merlin engine up the front. It's got quite a, an aft centre of gravity. But as you can see, bottom right photo, that's almost in the three point land. That you can almost see over the nose just because the way the, the engine is sat and you sit in the cockpit. The undercarriage is also very wide, so that gives you a little bit better stability. And it's got a really big, huge um, fin and rudder at the back. And then the last thing is you're sitting on the radiator, which is being blown by the Merlin engine. It's nicely in the prop wash, so it doesn't get too hot too quickly. So on the ground and landing it, it's a bit more forgiving. But actually in the air, it's a real handful to fly and to fly accurately. It's dynamically unstable. If you pull the aircraft into a turn, it's almost like she wants to over G and you have to push her to stop her over Ging. Um, quite slow and light in roll, um, very pitchy and, and very hard work on your arms in the pitch. So not what you'd call harmonized controls in any, um, uh, any stretch of the imagination. About halfway through the season, uh, after the first trip, you literally land with a thousand yard stare and you go, what have I signed up to here? But you get used to it quite quickly. Second trip you're displaying at 500 feet and then third, fourth trip you're down at 100 foot display heights. Um, when you start the season, uh, probably about halfway through, I'll then convert, if you go to the next slide, to the Spitfire. The way we're going to do the Spitfires is you first fly the Mark 9 and 16, ideally, which are the two aircraft on the right of your screen here. Mark 9 in desert coloured, Mark 16 at the bottom. So they're Merlin powered, so you're used to the engine. Um, uh, they are a little bit weighty in the early marks. So when you do land them, they're a bit more, you know, they sit down a bit more with a bit of weight. But the undercarriage on the Spitfire is much closer together and the fin and rudder is much smaller. So whilst flying the Spitfire is like flying a modern piston engine aircraft, it's beautifully harmonized. You can fly it with a couple of fingers on the stick. It is light, it's responsive, it is a delight. Uh, landing it is where my heart rate spikes. Um, I'm more, I concentrate more on the landing than doing a hundred foot display in these aircraft, because uh, that is the time I'm going to embarrass myself. Once they've got used to the Mark 9 or 16, uh, I'll put them in the baby Spitfires. Um, I talked about the Mark 2 Spitfire already, as you saw in the first picture. And then here, top left is a Mark 5. Almost exactly the same as the 9 and 16, actually a bit simpler. However, an even smaller fin and rudder and very light. 
So the chances of them picking a wing or just feeling a little bit uh, unsettled with a gust on landing, the chance of ground loop is a little bit higher. So we just let them settle into the bigger Spitfires before they go in that. And the last thing, just to terrify them when they think they got used to it, and most people warm to the Spitfire quickly, the last one is the PR-19, which is bottom left. The Merlin engine is about a thousand horsepower. It went up to about 1600 in war as they, as they modified it. Um, the Mark 19 is powered by Rolls-Royce Griffin. The Griffin engine is in wartime was another thousand horsepower. They got it up to about two and a half thousand. Not the ones we're flying now, we're looking after these. But she is a beast. Um, uh, I was talking earlier, crew speeds, Hurricane 165, a Merlin Spitfire about 180. The Griffin Spitfire will chug along, almost ticking over at uh, 200 knots. And if you put her up towards max continuous, probably 270 knots. Um, and those are the first aircraft that pilots started feeling transonic effects. So she is a beast. And I would say most people, when they get into the Griffin Spitfires, take a while to warm to them. But when you do, they're incredible fun to fly. Next one, please. Talking a lot about fighters because I'm a fighter pilot, but you imagine going from a, an, an A400M modern Airbus military transport into this, the Dakota. Um, the only good news for them is at least they get to have an instructor sitting next to them for the first few trips. But, you know, this is a real throwback as well. Um, of the four aircraft, uh, of the four things war winners that uh, Eisenhower was asked about, there's only one aircraft he picked and it was the Dakota for its ability to move, uh, you know, sort of people and, uh, and equipment around the battlefield. He saw it as a real war winner. Next slide, please. So um, the new bomber boys are all part-time, will come to us and they get into this beautiful aircraft, uh, initially dual and eventually they'll go off and uh, display this in its own right. Uh, and she's currently in uh, D-Day colors. Um, last year, I've got to think of where we are with everything. We did the 80th anniversary um, sorry, 75th anniversary of D-Day. And this is us dispatching paratroopers, uh, British current uh, paras uh, onto a World War II drop zone in Caen in Northern France for those uh, commemorations. So very poignant. And the next one shows you, I think the paras, they actually look excited to jump out of this aircraft. Um, uh, most of the people on the day were a full Colonel or higher because they didn't decide to delegate because for this, it was an honour. This was almost them as paras doing what their forefathers had done. They were absolutely over the moon to have the opportunity to jump out of a perfectly serviceable aircraft. Next slide takes us on to the jewel in the crown. Only two of these flying in the world, the Avro Lancaster. And for me as a bomber um, signifies the greatest loss, I think, of World War II. Um, uh, on the side, we have a plaque that says to remember the many. Everyone remembers the Churchill's uh, speech about the Battle of Britain fighter pilots, coining them as the, the phrase the few. Well, we remember the bomber command air crew as the many. Um, on the bomber, bomber command memorial uh, near Green Park, it, uh, it puts the number as 55,573 lost their lives. It's more than that. That doesn't equate to the ground crew who are a vital part of it. It doesn't in include people in accidents. There's so many missing in that number. Um, it, it, you had more chance, though, of being bomber command air crew. You had more chance of surviving the First World War trenches as a, a sub lieutenant than getting through. Um, there was a 43 percent death rate within bomber command. Uh, a hugely important task. It was the only way that we, we could bring the war to an end quickly. Uh, on one bombing raid alone uh, to Nuremberg, the, the greatest loss in one night by Bomber Command. They lost 96 Lancasters, uh, 545 air crew, more than all of the fighter pilots in the Battle of Britain. So, you know, that was one night. Next, please. And it's pretty much the last slide. So I'm, I'm about there. Um, is, you know, the aircraft itself is a beautiful aircraft. Um, they are currently, I hope you all see it in the next year or so, creating a documentary and it will feature our aircraft because... Um, it is probably the most representative flying over the dams of Dermont where they, uh, the 617 Squadron um, practiced um, uh, for the Dam Busters raid. Op chastise, as it was known, dropping the bouncing bomb, also known as, well, formerly known as upkeep. So that's the last I've got there. And then I thought on the last slide, I will just bring in a few points about how we operate. So uh, you'd be glad to know, as glider pilots, we have Flam on board all of our aircraft. Um, we needed to find, very much like yourself, a cheap and also lightweight and simple to install uh, piece of kit to reduce my highest risk 
and it's uh, I don't hold risk. I just manage it for my station commander. But all the way up, the biggest risk we see is mid-air collision. What a waste if you hit somebody else in the air when there's ways that we can avoid each other. So we have flam. We actually have power flam. So it shows me um, other transponder type contacts as well. Um, but certainly um, I've used it to great effect as I've uh, been working on summer weekends to avoid, you know, mass gliders. We also try to always have some sort of traffic service with a local um, uh, uh, a local uh, air, tra uh, air traffic control unit. But obviously, as you're aware, if you haven't got a transponder, and I know not many gliders do, uh, you're going to be primary contact only with no height. So P flam is hugely important for us. If I'm really, you know, if I'm flying into a really big density of gliders, the other option I've got as a military pilot is drop down to low level. I know if I stay a few miles away from you, uh, from your operating site and the military, we stay generally about two miles away as a minimum. Um, uh, if I'm right down low, you're not going to be there. I'm talking at 500 feet uh, because you're only going to be there if a you're doing obviously a landing out and about. Well, OK, fine. I can't I can't, uh, you know, sort of uh, guess that. Uh, but th those numbers should be very small if you're landing off uh, off site or. Um, you know, when you're down that low, you're looking at configuring, sorting your landing out and you'll be near the airfield. You know, we see this, you know, your activity is almost a cone coming from the uh, from the, the launch site. So if I can drop down low, I know at least most of the threat is above me. So that's hugely important. We have a moving map display we call uh, ACANS. Uh, it's the same as the uh, our, um, the uh, police and the air ambulances use. Uh, but in essence, it's a moving map to give a situational awareness. So there should be. And that's only been in for two years. Before that, I used good old map and stopwatch. So with that, I should be less chances for me to go stumbling through your sites without knowing. If we operate near you at any point, you will get us a, a phone call from us. If we are doing a formal fly pass, I will pick up the phone. I will find out you know, your club's number and I will ring up and say, hey, this is us. But wherever we got fly past, there are no times. Warnings, normally an hour long, saying the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight is doing a fly past in this area. And there you go. I'll, I'll leave it at that. And really, then we can come back to saying hello again uh, and go through questions, which is where I find the most uh, interesting bit. Great. Thanks very much. So if... Um... People would like to send me questions through the chat facility, then I will relay them to Disco. Um, but I've got a I've got a question just to um, start things off. Um, so, from your perspective, and you, you've obviously got a lot of experience with flying different aircraft. What's what's the best handling aircraft that you've flown? I think best handling, best all round, I would say. Uh, and if I put the fun factor in, so I was the Hawk. I think the Hawk is the the MG, the sports, the simple sports car of the fast jet world. Uh, the Hawk T1, the Hawk T2 that we're currently using is very different. It looks like, you know, a modern typhoon in the cockpit. But the Hawk T1, you could start with about three button presses. From climbing the cockpit and strapping in, you could be taxiing in about three minutes. It was simple, yet you could cruise comfortably at 420 knots. You could go high level and get yourself down to Spain. Um, and it was just look out the window and enjoy yourself. So I'd say the Hawk is brilliant. And that's the same type the Red Arrows are still flying today. You know, it's a beautiful, simple, um, yeah, easy to fly. Right, okay. And um, you talked a bit about the, um, the servicing of those vintage aircraft uh, and so on. So, uh, and obviously you, you, you do a fly past over central London. So how, mm -hmm. how reliable are those vintage aircraft? And um, is, is that ever a concern? It is. Uh, every time I fly this aircraft, and that's a really good point you bring out. So from a civil perspective, you'll never get authority to fly over the central London with a single engine piston aircraft. Uh, it is a risk that is held at the government level. So it goes up to the chief of the air staff and then it's a sit down chat with the, um, uh, the Secretary of State for Defence. Um, and they are looking at the risk of us having an engine failure and, and having an accident. The third party risk of those people on the floor minding their own business uh, with the national pride element. And it's an interesting balance to have. Luckily, I'm way below that pay grade to worry about it. All I do is produce the documents. The aircraft actually are very serviceable. Um, uh, we are looking after them far better than we would have in the past. I reckon for every hour I fly this, it's a minimum of 10 hours time that my engineers are pouring over them. 
I think uh, the classic is before he passed away, uh, World War II Spitfire pilot. Our Mark V is painted in the colours he flew, an aircraft it represents, for D-Day. His name was Tony Cooper. Before he passed away, he saw the aircraft painted in his D-Day livery uh, with his son's name on the side. And he was blown away. And then he paused and said, You've, there's one problem with the aircraft. And we're like, what have we done? And he said, it never looked this good. He, uh, he said, these look better than, you know, aircraft that come out of the factory of Supermarine. These are just immaculate. Um, so I'm incredibly confident. When we do have failures, um, and I've been on the receiving end of a, a Merlin that had a slight snag, they're, they're, they're bulletproof. These things will run and run and run and keep you going. They give you a lot of warning. So uh, the areas where we're in central London, if something happened, it, normally the Merlin gives you enough warning to go, right, I'm out of dodge now. Uh, and you'll also notice if you ever see photos of us walk into the aircraft for a, a London fly pass, we'll have life jackets on. Because our number one option, if things go bad quickly, is we go in the Thames. And then there's only one person who worries, one person's life to worry about, and that's a sucker in the aircraft and not those people walking around London. Okay, that's 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 very interesting. And and do do you then uh, wear parachutes in these vintage aircraft? Yeah, so uh, all of our aircraft, and it's a it's a duty of care for, from a working environment perspective. Uh, I don't have a choice in in a Royal Air Force aircraft. You're always issued a parachute. The ones we have got are modern GQ parachutes, fast opening, spring assisted. Um, uh, I think the certificate design, minimum operating 500 feet, they've certainly operate them down to 200 feet and they open open in time. Uh, and we also have a Cypress um, set up on it as well. So we've got a static line that turns the Cypress on. So if I bang my head on the way out, it asks a few simple questions as it activates as I leave the cockpit and the static line pulls, and then that can automatically open the chute as well. Okay, thanks. Um, I've Got a question from uh, Steve Jones, um, and he's asking, do, do you have any plans for any other um, uh, aircraft to be restored uh, in the future? So do you have any plans for the for other aircraft or restoring aircraft? And um, are there any other RAF aircraft that are becoming obsolete that you would um, have in the collection? Yeah, it, it's a real good balancing trick, a, a balancing act. I think the World War II vintage aircraft are really good because they're quite simple. And in fact, right, I'm being really disingenuous now. OK, you've got to be an incredible craftsperson. But if you can cut, shape and rivet metal, you can make a Spitfire. All right. Obviously, it's way more complicated than that. But I'm not looking at computer chips. So you've got to keep running and, and that sort of stuff. The obsolescence isn't an issue. Uh, I say um, most of the vast majority of the parts can be made. As soon as you start walking into the jet rate age, everything gets more complicated. It gets more costly as well per hour of flight. So um, and, and the Royal Naval uh, Historic Flight, now known as Navy Wings, because they're not part of the military anymore, find that. And, and they've struggled in certain areas with that. So I want to stay in that vintage sort of world. Also, I think there's a real passion within the nation at the moment for that era. So that's really handy. You see lots of 1940 events. Um, even so, I wouldn't take on jet aircraft. I wouldn't look at saying, "Oh, wouldn't it be good to have a hunt or a, or a, or a you know, um, a vampire." It's just too complex. I don't have room in my hangar. But even if somebody says, you know, the classic is, "What about a, a mosquito?" Um, the problem is because we're certified, I now have to go. So they are making down in New Zealand new mosquitoes. I would have to show that to the military aviation authority, and they go prove to me that's safe. Have we assured the company that's made it? What glue are they using? How did they, what wood? What? I mean, I'd probably take an aircraft, put it in my hangar, and 10 years later, we'd still be talking about how airworthy it was. Because in the military, we don't have um, permit to fly. And all of the vintage aircraft in the civil world work under permit to fly with much more uh, sort of uh, relaxed uh, limitations uh, against the engineering and airworthiness of it. So I, I don't think so. Also, I can't fit much more in my hangar. And I think... I really do think the chief of the air staff would think I'm taking the mickey if I try to get, you know, a 13th aircraft. It, it might be worth a try, but yeah, I understand that. Yeah. The last aircraft uh, we brought online was the Mark 16. Um, three of them arrived from Stafford, which is one of our big sort of holding areas. I'm sure the, the, um, the Holy Grail is sitting there from uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Massive big storage facility and three turned up. They said cannibalize these for spares. And our engineers went, 
I think we could make one of these fly. And underneath the tarpaulin over about five years, they they scavenge from two to make one serviceable. And in 2012, it flew again after 35 years. So um, that I think as far as the flight can push its luck. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, I've got a, a question from Ian Pleasance saying he, he's flown a variety of modern tricycle tailwheel um, SEP aircraft, um, including tailwheel Cessnas and, and other aerobatic aircraft. Um, he, he asked, what would you say the biggest adaptation is that, that you need to move to a Spitfire or Hurricane from a modern SEP tailwheel? Yeah, if you go really modern, they're a little bit easier. But something like, you know, an early model Cessna, you know, they come in with good handling characteristics and challenges. Um, not a lot. Um, and I say in some ways a chipmunk is uh, more challenging than a Spitfire or a Hurricane. Um, so a chipmunk uh, and any light aircraft, when you're looking really small, generally, you know, you're going to have to fight. They're not speed stable. Uh, you're going to have to fight the windy, gusty conditions more. I think the biggest problem you get when you step up in the horsepower is all of the propeller um, theory aspects. So, you know, your, your slipstream, your gyroscopic effects and everything else are just massively magnified. So to give you an idea, in a Griffin powered Spitfire, if I move my left hand too quickly with the power, I physically cannot stay on the 155 foot wide uh, runway at Coningsby. There is too much torque there and I don't have enough rudder authority. OK, so you have to slowly, gingerly bring it up to get your airspeed up. So it's really thinking about what this left hand's doing um, uh, to the point that, you know, I will find I'm getting airborne. I've got absolute full rudder on and then I stop moving this until I get a bit more authority and that comes off. And then I can put a bit more power on. So you're balancing it. So I think that's all it is. Um, it's just getting used to that extra torque, slipstream and gyroscopic effects. But actually on approach, um, actually, it's much more speed stable, uh, constant speed prop. And she's nice and heavy and the gusts kind of don't affect you so much. Great, thank you. Um, and um, I was, I was going to ask you again, you know, for people that switch between tail draggers and tricycle um, aircraft, um, any, any tips around that? Obviously, you have to put a different head on when you're flying a tricycle aircraft to when you're flying a, a tailwheel aircraft. But any it tips is. about switching between the two? I think, you know, I don't generally switch from, uh, you know, sort of tricycle back. I do a bit of Cessna fly. I haven't done it for a while because of COVID. I always just pause and I generally, you know, have a think before you go. So you know what you're doing. You know the aircraft you're flying. You've got an understanding of what where the changes are going to be. The biggest thing for me, and I do it in all of our aircraft, so between a Spitfire and a Hurricane, they're all subtly different, is... That little bit when I'm doing my engine check and I just sit there and I have a really think of it. I go through how I'll get out the aircraft. I touch drill everything. I'll remind myself as I'm pointing into wind doing an engine check, I'll think, right, where's the sun? So if I have an engine failure, if I put the sun back in that position, I'm pointing into wind. I have a look, not just at the speed I want to glide at, but I'll look at it and think, OK, that's in the nine o'clock position on my airspeed indicator. So if my brain loses all of its capacity because the engine's gone bang, sun over there, speed in the nine o'clock, I'm safe. Now I'll think about what else I've got to do to save myself. Um, and just having a look at that attitude, your landing attitude. Every time I line up on the runway, I stop and pause and look and go, this is what it's like to land this particular mark of aircraft. This is where, you know, the height I feel, how close my bum is to the ground and in a glider, incredibly close. But, you know, the Spitfire and the Hurricane, you've got different seating positions. The Spitfire is a lot lower. And I just stop and I just pause. OK, that's that's interesting. And, and earlier on, you were talking about the, um, the hurricane as being quite heavy in pitch. Um, is it possible to trim? Is there a trimmer in that aircraft? There is. And you need to trim um, something like a chipmunk. Uh, you know, I, I, it's very light. I could I don't have to trim if I you know, if I don't want to in the normal flight range. The hurricane, you can get yourself in a position with two hands. You physically can't use the controls anymore. You have to trim. It's a very, very heavy it's got a spade grip, so that circle atop to the stick, which is really good to grab your two hands on. Uh, and in a display, I will in the Hurricane have to use both arms. Um, but the trim is a vital bit in that. So in the Hurricane and Spitfire, you have an uh, elevator trim and you also have a, a rudder trim as well. Rudder bias, as they used to call it in the war. Um, but there's nothing for the aileron. Uh, to do roll, trim the roll in uh, the Hurricane, it's a piece of thread is put underneath the, um, the cloth but you, rate, you put it along the top of one aileron, then you cloth over the top of it to make a slight little lip up. 
Uh, and in the Spitfire, you get a, a piece of four by two and a hammer and you bend the back of one of the ailerons up to trim it out that way. So we call it reflexing because it sounds better than hitting it with a hammer. Uh, and we'll land and say, it's rolling to the left. And the engineer will come out with his, you know, very calibrated eye and go, how much? And I go, ooh, about that much. And he goes, whack. And then I go flying, land and go, yeah, that's all right. Normally I go, right, it's going the other way now. And he goes, oh, right, okay, I'll bang the other one. Great, that's, that's, that's good. Um, and... Uh... Just in, in terms of uh, younger people and aspiring to um, you know, careers, so what, what advice would you give to a younger person who was interested in um, flying fast jets in the RAF? Um, so, you know, if, if they're with your club and they're flying gliders, I think they're already on a really good start because you get the absolute pure handling. You get what I love about gliding as well. And it's the, one of the, uh, I had a cadet chat I gave recently. He said, what's one of your advice of flying, a, you know, flying aircraft to make you, you know, better going through training? I said, get your head out of the cockpit. So flying an aircraft with limited instruments is brilliant because you're looking at the attitude. You're getting a feeling of which way's up, down, orientate yourself. And inside is just a glance at your airspeed and things like that. So it's hugely important. So I think gliding is such a good way to start your, your flying career. Um, on top of that, you know, I'd always go, the vast majority are joining up now with a degree. Don't rush it. Go to university, join a university air squadron. And then you know that you get a feeling of, yeah, actually, I like this military flying, this, this military camaraderie, which I love. I've been in the Air Force now 31 years. So, you know, I, I'm not going to say I don't enjoy it. Um, uh, and from then on, it's be prepared. Um, it doesn't matter. There are some naturally talented pilots, but generally they're the ones that in the background are doing all the hard work as well. So you do, if the, the people that fail are generally the people, I think, that rock up and they haven't done the preparation and if you don't prepare, the flying element of it is so much harder. And even when you get better and you think you can do it, I think everybody's had that trip where you go, I just wish I'd done a bit more route study. I just wish this because I had to work that little bit hard in the air because I, I wasn't as prepared as I could have been. Well, that's, that's great. I've, I've got a, a question from Andreas as well. Um, ha have you ever had the chance to fly a World War I aircraft? No, I've never flown a, a biplane. I will fix that at some point, but no, I haven't. So uh, the one I would love to fly because it, it's it's not World War One, but you know it's such an iconic train. It would be the Tiger Moth, uh, and I've heard all about it. No brakes, no tailwheel, a bit of a skid, a bit of a Bambi on uh, ice when you're over the concrete. You know, loves uh, you know much nicer to be on the grass. So I, no, I haven't, and it's something I definitely end up doing. And um, I've got a question from Nick White um, asking a, a few years ago, the Canadian Lancaster came across and did some dual displays and, and they were fantastic. And are there any plans in the future for the um, uh, BBOF to do displays with other non-RAF aircraft? So um, we generally don't do displays because the amount of time it takes to lead up to that and the hours are very um, precious. We do uh, fly pass. Uh, and we'll do PR shots with other aircraft. Um, so we've done that quite regularly. Um, uh, we've been up with the Dutch a lot, so they've got a Mitchell, but it's generally for the PR photo shoots. Um, but sometimes we'll do fly pass with them. So that will happen. Um, I'm trying to think, my, one of my plans this year with the Battle of Britain 80th was to try and uh, fly uh, our Mark II Spitfire with R4, which is the, the probably the more famous Battle of Britain veteran hurricane. And uh, in the Spitfire company at Biggin Hill, they've got a, um, a Battle of Britain veteran 109E. Um, and I thought, wouldn't it be great to get those three up? But unfortunately, there was major serviceability issues with the German fighter. Uh, and, uh, and then COVID cracked on and, and it all fell apart. But we will try and do it. But that would generally be fly pass, a number of series of just back and forth in nice formations for photos. That's all. OK, fantastic. Uh, well. Thank you very much for your time and, and for, for sharing your, your um, experience with us and, and, and what it's like um, flying these fantastic aircraft. Um, we re really um, like to say a big thank you uh, on behalf of the club for, for spending time with us this evening. Um, and obviously um, we, we have a um, open day once a year. Normally when COVID has gone away, hopefully we'll be able to resume that next summer. Um, 
So you, you mentioned earlier, I think, that there's a there's a, a way which we might be able to apply to have a fire pass or something. Yeah, and, and we do some. I know uh, Crowland, which is Glad Insight up near us, we do there a uh, little open day as well, and we go and do a fly pass. So the, uh, the cutoff date to put a request in is Monday. So this is quite good, isn't it? Luckily, to do the request form, it takes you about three minutes. So if you go to the BBMF website, uh, you just Google BBMF and it'll come up as an REF uh, website. Go in there and you'll see under operations, you'll see as you scroll down a request a fly past. It is a one piece of paper that you fill in. Now, you may not know the exact date now. Have a guess. What I would say is get it on the system and then you can amend it. That what the Air Force isn't very good at, uh, and we don't do all of this. This happens at RAF Northolt with the air events team. They're not very good at doing late bids. So on Monday or tomorrow, you can email it to them and it'll sit there. Get a request in and say, you know, this date, just pick a date if need be, you know, roughly what you think, uh, you know, and all the other details. In essence, you just got to put down, you know, a, a lat long, what the event is, roughly how many people are coming and what aircraft you want. Now, if you say I want Typhoon, it's not going to come because Typhoon will only do displays. BBMF, tick all the boxes. And what generally happens is when it comes to us, we'll have a look on that day what else we're doing. And if you fit in, so there's a bit of luck in it as well, we'll go, yeah, OK, we can do that one on the way around. So absolutely. Uh, but this is perfect time. And I was going to say this as well. Uh, perfect time. You've got till Monday to get that form in. But I mean, literally, you can fill it in in about 10 minutes. Right. That's, that's, that's good to know. I've got, I've got another question here from Vernon asking, uh, um, what, what does the commanding officer of the BBMF do next? Ah, interesting. Well, I, I, I'm going to give you something really boring now. I'm not a commanding officer. I'm officer commanding. And everyone said, what's the difference? I can't put people in jail. A commanding officer is as the right to put people in jail. I can't. So, so as officer commanding BBMF, uh, I like not being able to put people in jail. Um, uh, I have no idea. What I'd like to do is probably stay in the local area of Lincolnshire, uh, where there's a few bases, and probably go back to training. I really have an affinity to train. Uh, I've always enjoyed it. Um, I like the purity of, you know, just trying to give your information to somebody else and see how they move on, as I'm doing with the new fighter pilots on BBMF now. It's a real challenge, but also something I find very rewarding. So, yeah, you know, a really good job for me, elementary flying trainer. I'll go back there and um, teach the new boys and girls exactly how to do this. Thank you. That's, that, that's, that's great. And um, I'd just like to uh, offer you an invitation that if you or any of your uh, squadron wanted to come and fly with us in better times when COVID has gone, um, uh, we'd be delighted to take you or, or, or others on a cross-country glider flight. And from a collision avoidance perspective, that might help people understand what it's like from, from our end. That sounds good. Uh, very kind of you. Great, thanks. And uh, some, somebody here says, uh, they, uh, somebody called Isaac Jones says, uh, thank you very much, but you gave me your map from your hurricane last year. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I like to do that. And uh, it's always good to see what we've done and where we've done. So I'll always get, you know, let people have maps. So it's lovely to say that one's out there. So yeah, to see what we do, how we do it. If nothing else, that might have given you an idea of, uh, you know, what we did that day and, uh, and, and how we plan. The good thing is, from a military perspective, Obviously, in the civil charts, you'll see that you're kind of like a little very small symbol. Military, for all the major glider sites, use a two mile avoid around them for us, uh, just not to go near there. So we try and avoid you as much as we can. That'd be great. So, well, um, thank you again. It's been, it's been great. And um, uh, we, as I say, we, we offer that invitation to you and to anybody of your squadron that would like to come and fly with us. We'd be delighted to uh, uh, entertain you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.